Hey everyone, welcome to the channel and I hope you're doing well. If you're new here, we talk about crime, mystery and other subjects. So if you're interested, be sure to subscribe as we have content every single week. Anyway, let's get into today's case. Juanita Jo Nielsen was an Australian activist, journalist and newspaper publisher who disappeared in King's Cross in July of 1975. She was 38 years old at the time. The main consensus around her disappearance is that she was killed because of her activism, but to this day, we still don't know what happened to Juanita Nielsen. Juanita John Smith was born on the 22nd of April 1937 in New Lambton, New South Wales, Australia. Her parents, Neil Donovan Smith and Vilma Gray Smith, separated soon after Juanita was born. Juanita then moved to Kilara, Sydney to be raised by her maternal grandmother. Neil was born in England and was the heir to the Mark Foy's retail fortune. His father, John Joseph Smith, was the managing director and chairman of Mark Foy's Limited, and Neil's mother, Kathleen Sophie Foy, was the sister of Mark Foy himself. In her youth, Juanita attended Ravenswood School for Girls in Gordon. After leaving school, she worked as a glove model for Mark Foy's until 1959 when she would move overseas. Three years later, Juanita married Jorgen Fritz Nielsen, a Danish merchant in Japan. The marriage lasted roughly three years. Juanita then moved back to Sydney in 1965 and worked for a fashion boutique of Mark Foy's for five years or so. At the start of the 1970s, Juanita took ownership of Now Newspaper in King's Cross, Sydney. Juanita published the newspaper every two weeks while working from home at 202 Victoria Street. She was assisted by her business partner, David Farrell. Juanita also modelled for the newspaper and was often featured showing off fashion and hairstyles. In the early 1970s, Juanita found herself involved in something far more serious than fashion and hairstyles. A property developer by the name of Frank Thiemann wanted to build a $40 million apartment complex in King's Cross. His plans would affect many locals though, with dozens of people facing eviction from their Victoria Street homes if the construction went ahead. These houses had beautiful views of the city and harbour, which is why it was such a sought after location for apartment buildings. The King's Cross community obviously were very much against this and they were successful in their campaign for a green ban on the area after lobbying for the Builders Labourers' Federation to impose one. Victoria Street residents refused to leave their homes and Juanita would cover the developments in now newspaper. Juanita herself even submitted an objection to the local council. But things weren't so straightforward. Frank Thiemann wasn't impressed with the actions of everyone trying to save Victoria Street, and residents were often harassed by men Frank had employed as he attempted to get them evicted. Also, these men even had help from a former New South Wales police detective, Fred Cray. Fred was supposedly heavily involved in organised crime, and was even suspected of murdering a prostitute, Shirley Briffman, after she accused him of being corrupt. In any case, despite great efforts to keep Frank Thiemann out, the Green Ban was sadly broken in 1974, after the federal leadership of the Builders Labourers Federation had been bribed by developers. They went on to dismiss their New South Wales branch, which left Juanita and the Victoria Street residents as the only opposition of Frank Thiemann. Nevertheless, Juanita had no intention of giving up just yet, and she was able to successfully convince the Water Board Union to impose a green ban of their own. As of June 1975, the money borrowed by Frank for the development was accruing at $16,800 per week. The Carousel Club was a bar in King's Cross owned by Abe Saffron. It was only one of many bars and nightclubs owned by Abe. He happened to also be a major player in the organised crime scene in Sydney at the time. His son claims 
that Abe had lent a lot of money to numerous businessmen in the area, including Frank Thiemann. On the 13th of June 1975, Juanita was invited to a press night being held at the Carousel Club by James Anderson, the manager of said club. This was despite the fact that the two had never had anything to do with one another previously. Juanita's paper didn't give out free publicity to businesses, which is why she normally would not have been asked to go to such an event. Regardless of the invite, Juanita did not attend the press evening. James was reported to have been furious at this, and on the 29th of June, Juanita was invited out by the Carousel Club's PR manager, Lloyd Marshall. Juanita's business partner later stated that she did not attend the meeting after she grew suspicious of the whole situation. The following day on June 30th, 1975, two employees of the Carousel, Edward Trigg and Shane Martin Simmons, showed up at Juanita's house under the pretext of wanting to discuss advertising in her newspaper. When they knocked on the door, however, David answered it. It was later revealed that they had planned to grab Juanita when she answered the door, which was obviously foiled after she didn't. Juanita had been listening from another room while the men told David their made up story. David said that after this incident, Juanita had grown worried about her activism putting her in some serious danger. She told David about her concerns and kept him constantly informed on where she was. But sadly, that wasn't enough to keep her safe. Two weeks later, Juanita Joan Nielsen disappeared. In a final attempt to get Juanita into the club, Loretta Crawford, the carousel's receptionist, was instructed by Edward Trigg to call Juanita and invite her to discuss an advertising proposal the following morning, on Friday, July 4th. Loretta said she knew the advertising excuse was untrue, as the club didn't advertise in any local papers, and that she was surprised when Juanita showed up that morning. Juanita showed up on that Friday for her meeting at the Carousel Club with Edward. She called David at around 10.30am to tell him she was going to be late for the meeting. Loretta said that Juanita arrived at the club and came straight up to the first floor, where her reception desk was. Juanita supposedly said she had a hard night, indicating she was hungover, and Loretta offered her a coffee, which Juanita refused after Edward walked into the room ready for the meeting. Loretta said it was unusual for Edward to be on time for a meeting, as he was often late for things. Original statements to police claimed that Juanita left the club alone. This was according to Loretta and Edward. But Loretta changed her story a year later and said Juanita left with Edward that day. A real estate agent who had been in King's Cross at the time stated he witnessed Juanita get into a yellow car outside the club. Two men were seen in the car at the time Loretta believes Juanita was blackmailing Abe Saffron with alleged documents that could expose him and a building going up in Victoria Street being constructed with low quality materials. Juanita was not seen after this day. Her handbag was discovered eight days later on a freeway near Penrith, West Sydney. Edward Trigg, Shane Martin Simmons and Lloyd Marshall who had all worked at the club, were charged with conspiring to kidnap Juanita Nielsen. In his November 6th interview with police, Shane revealed that the day they visited Juanita's home on June 30th had been a ruse, and that they had intended to kidnap her had her business partner David not answered the door. He claimed they were going to take her to people who wanted to talk to her. As he put it that day, they intended to just grab her arms and stop her calling out. No real rough stuff, no gangster stuff. We thought that just two guys telling her to come would be enough to make her think if she didn't come, she might get hurt. We talked about it when she came into the room. One of us would be standing there and the other would come up behind her and just quietly grab her by the arms and maybe 
put a hand over her mouth or a pillow slip over the head. He claimed to not know who they were taking Juanita to. The trial for Juanita's kidnapping started in 1980. Lloyd Marshall was acquitted after the judge ruled there was no evidence that linked him to the plan to forcefully kidnap Juanita. A retrial was ordered and set for the following year after the jury could not reach a verdict on Edward and Shane's guilt. In 1981, Shane was retried and convicted of conspiracy to kidnap and he served two years in prison. The judge asked Shane for information regarding Juanita's kidnapping, but he remained tight-lipped. By the time of the retrial, Edward was long gone. He had fled to the United States using a fake passport. He was arrested in 1982 in San Francisco. Before being sent back to Australia, Edward told police, They're making all this noise over a woman who is nothing but an out-and-out communist. No loss to society at all. In 1983, Edward pleaded guilty to the charges and spent three years in prison. In 1983, a coronial inquest was held to try and finally get to the bottom of her disappearance and several witnesses were called up to give statements. Frank Thiemann was one of them and he denied Juanita posed any threat to his building plans. Abe Saffron was also called upon and he claimed he only knew of Juanita's disappearance from a newspaper report and hadn't asked anyone for more information after that. The inquest also learnt of James Anderson, the club manager's many links to Frank Thiemann. James denied any involvement in her disappearance. James claimed that Fred Cray, the corrupt police officer, was responsible for Juanita's death. The council that represented Juanita's estate stated that it was impossible for Edward and Shane to not have been involved in Juanita going missing. Well, as both groups were clearly trying to make Juanita disappear, it would be a very, very unbelievable coincidence that neither was responsible for this. Unfortunately, the council at the inquest ruled that there was not enough evidence to make a case against any of the potential suspects. Also, they believed that Juanita had either died on July 4th, 1975, or soon after. In 1994, police failings were publicly criticised by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Joint Committee. They also made links between Juanita's disappearance and certain property developers and the King's Cross organised crime. There have been numerous new claims over the years since Juanita's disappearance. One being from Marilyn King, a former girlfriend of Edward Trigg. She told a journalist that Edward had come home on July 4th, 1975, with blood staining his clothes. He supposedly also had a blood spattered receipt that had been signed by Juanita for advertising money he had paid her. Marilyn claimed he threw away the bloody shirt and the piece of paper, and she never gave any of this information to police. Loretta Crawford later came out and said in a 2004 ABC TV interview that she had given false testimony with regards to the case. She claimed that James Anderson had convinced her to give statements that would protect him, but due to his recent death, she was now able to tell the truth. Loretta now said that Juanita never left the club at all. She was instead murdered in the basement with Edward and Shane present. Loretta said she had seen Juanita's body with her own eyes with a gunshot wound. There was said to be a third man in the room, standing over Juanita's body holding a gun, but she did not name this man. It is a few years away from being half a century since Juanita Nielsen disappeared. Some theorise that she may have been buried somewhere in the Blue Mountains, since the contents of her handbag was found scattered along the edge of the highway that runs between Sydney and the Blue Mountains. As of 2021, the reward for any information regarding her case has reached $1 million. Her family and police have said they are holding on to hope to one day be able to find her remains and lay her to rest. 
Thank you everyone for watching this video on Juanita Nielsen. I hope you found the case interesting. It's very tragic and let me know what you thought or what happened to her down below in the comments. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and I hope you guys have notifications turned on so you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. If you have any suggestions, be sure also to leave them in the comments. And anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next video. Thanks.